Welcome again. Here we're going to talk about cardiac disease in pregnancy, and this is a topic that fits squarely into the domain of a maternal fetal medicine specialist, a high-risk pregnancy specialist. And this, we only really need to touch the surface of it because there are specialists that will manage this. And so even on an OBGYN rotation, you're not going to be expected to know this in too great of detail like I said, because we have specialists to deal with this. And so what you need to know are uh, the general management and when to send these patients off and to whom to send these patients off to. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click on the link below in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner of this screen and it should link you up. If you could consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. If you subscribe, you'll have access to some of my premium videos in which I go over various case reviews as well as how to subsequently form a differential diagnosis, a treatment plan, etc. And that should be very useful to you both for clinical practice and as you gear up to study for step three of the USMLE. Thank you very much in advance for your patronage. So we're going to do a quick review of some of the physiology of the cardiovascular system, some of the changes that happen in pregnancy, and one related pathophysiologic issue, namely Eisenmenger syndrome, which is very important because this is one of the most riskiest things that can be going on uh, during pregnancy that can confer a very high maternal morbidity and mortality rate. We'll talk about the NYHA functional classification. You'll see this thrown around. It's also very important for prognosticating how risky the pregnancy is going to be. And then we'll talk about two different types of heart disease, acquired and congenital. Acquired used to be more common than congenital, but now that more and more people are living longer with congenital heart disease, living into childbearing age, we're starting to see congenital heart disease more commonly than acquired heart disease. And also because one of the big causes of acquired heart disease was rheumatic, uh, the rheumatic heart disease, namely mitral, mitral stenosis. And we don't see that anymore because people just don't get rheumatic fever like they used to, at least in the Western world. And then we'll talk about peripartium cardiomyopathy, but this is going to be, I'm going to save this for its own talk, so we're not going to talk about that here, but we will make references to peripartum cardiomyopathy throughout this lecture. So the cardiovascular changes in pregnancy, what I really want you to boil down from this is that there is an increased plasma volume and there is a reduced systemic vascular resistance. So Increased plasma volume would mean that your blood pressure would go up. Reduced systemic vascular resistance means your blood pressure would go down. And when you put the two of those together, you have a mild decrease in your diastolic blood pressure. Your systolic blood pressure tends to stay about the same. And this will rebound back as the pregnancy progresses. Usually hits its nadir at some point in the second trimester. So there are a couple things that are important out of this big complex uh, diagram that I found online. And what is really important is that there is an increased preload. So what that means, and that's really derived from the increased plasma volume, what that means is that there is an increased end diastolic volume. Okay, that's not the exact physiologic definition, but for our purposes, there is more blood sitting in the, the left ventricle uh, after pumping. Uh, after uh, uh, diastole is, is finished. So it's end diastolic volume. And what this is going to result in is it's going to result in an increased stroke volume because you have more blood in the heart before it gets ready to pump, and that's that Frank Starling mechanism, which means that the more blood is in the heart, the, the harder it's going to pump. So this all means increased preload. You also have uh, a change in your filling time, which allows you to get more blood into the heart. 
So in addition to this, you also have a, a uh, decreased afterload. So all afterload is, is the pressure gradient that the heart is pumping against. And so because our systemic vascular resistance goes down, the heart is pumping against a lower pressure gradient, and the pressure is going to be higher, of course, in the systemic circulation than in the heart. And so it's pumping against that. If the systemic vascular resistance goes down, it's easier for the heart to pump blood out. And that is why uh, we see a, an increased stroke volume. So you have an increased stroke volume. You also have a slightly increased heart rate. That all is going to mean that the cardiac output goes up. So the exact numbers, plasma volume increases around 30 to 50 percent, the cardiac output increases around 30 to 50 percent, and the heart rate increases around 15 percent. Okay, so it's good to know as far as pregnancy goes, there's an increased plasma volume, there's a reduced systemic vascular resistance, and this will translate to an increase in cardiac output, and that is really good because we need to get more blood to the placenta. We have this new organ and we need to get more blood to it. We need to perfuse all the maternal organs, yes, but we also need to perfuse this new organ, the placenta, and this is very useful to us. Now, as we're going to see, the fact that we have increased plasma volume, the fact that we have reduced systemic vascular resistance is going to come into play when it comes to some of the congenital and acquired heart diseases and it's going to it's going to possibly, with some of those diseases, the symptoms will be unmasked for the, for the first time uh, because of this new state that the woman is in. Some related pathophysiology, so I expect that you know your anatomy of the heart. There we go. Okay, so this is Eisenmenger syndrome. So we normally don't see a ventricular septal defect. However, in some women, they will have it. So... In most people, a ventricular septal defect, a small one, uh, is, 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 no, is, well, not normal, but it's uh, subclinical. Now, if that ventricular septal defect is large enough, what can happen is that the, there's going to be increased blood flow to the lungs because you have higher pressure in the left ventricle than in the right ventricle. That's going to push more blood to the lungs. A higher pressure in the left ventricle pushes blood over to the lower pressure in the right ventricle, and that means more blood flow going to the lungs. That means you have a higher pulmonary pressure. That higher pulmonary pressure is going to result in a thickened wall in the pulmonary arteries, and ultimately what this can lead to is a higher pressure in the right ventricle, which is then going to push blood from the right ventricle to the left ventricle. And that means that blood that's coming out of the left ventricle is going to be partially deoxygenated. Okay, we should have fully oxygenated blood coming out the left ventricle. But if you start to have a shunt from the right to the left, then you start to have deoxygenated blood mixing with oxygenated blood and going out to the body. And that is a big problem. Okay, it's not so much a problem that you have blood coming from the left to the right because you just have oxygenated blood going back to the lungs for a second go around. But when that blood starts to move from the right to the left, as it will when the pulmonary pressure increases enough because the, you have wall thickening, then you start to have problems and this is Eisenmenger syndrome. Now you can imagine that pregnancy is going to exacerbate this. Why is it going to exacerbate it? because the systemic vascular resistance goes down. And when the systemic vascular resistance goes down, there's less pressure, even less pressure, in the systemic circulation. And what's that going to do? It's going to reduce pressure in the left ventricle. If there's less pressure, even less pressure in the left ventricle, it's gonna be much easier, even easier than before. It's going to be much easier for blood to move from the right to the left. So you're going to have even more deoxygenated blood making it out to the systemic circulation. So this is going to, pregnancy is going to worsen Eisenmenger syndrome. And, you, and, and so one of the big things with Eisenmenger syndrome is that you need to avoid hypotension. And pregnancy already causes a slight decrease in the blood pressure. And so if, you, if it becomes even worse where you have even 
worse hypotension, then you just worsen the right to left shunting. Okay, and so this is why Eisenmenger syndrome is a really bad deal in pregnancy. And this is actually, uh, Eisenmenger syndrome confers the worst prognosis in pregnancy out of all of the cardiovascular diseases that we're going to talk about. So we have this NYHA functional classification, and you will see this thrown around a lot. It can be hard to memorize what all these classifications mean, so I'm going to try and break this down and make it a little bit easier for you. So there's four classes of NYHA, one being the least severe, four being the most severe. So what does one mean? One means pretty much they have heart failure, but there's really no symptoms. So no symptoms at rest, and no symptoms during activity. Four is the worst. So four means they have symptoms at rest and they have severe symptoms during activity. Now whether it's mild or moderate or severe is really pretty subjective, but it just means that their symptoms limit their ability to uh, be active. Two and three, again, here are pretty subjective. So two and three, just like one, have no symptoms at rest, but with two, it's quote unquote mild symptoms. And with three, it's more severe. Okay, so they, with, with two, they have to do a lot more before they develop symptoms. Maybe go up a few flights of stairs or try to walk uh, five or six city blocks. With three, it's more activities of daily life. Getting up and, and making coffee, for instance. They, so they tend to be a lot, more, uh, a lot more restricted as far as their activities go. And the symptoms... What we're talking about here are things like fatigue, palpitations, dyspnea. What about maternal mortality risk? So things that confer a low mortality risk would be things like atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect. Here we're talking about small defects that don't cause Eisenmenger syndrome or any of those awful things. And if they're small, they probably won't cause Eisenmenger syndrome because you have minimal shunting from the left to the right, and so you don't have that much more blood going to the lungs. And so you don't develop that, uh, that wall thickening that ultimately causes Eisenmenger syndrome. Most septal defects are pretty small, and so you're not going to run into Eisenmenger syndrome, and so these confer a relatively low mortality risk. Minimal mitral stenosis, uh, a biological valve, a porcine valve, which just means pig, pig valve, and corrected tetralogy of fallow. And most patients nowadays have corrected tetralogy of fallow. It gets diagnosed during childhood and corrected. Intermediate mortality risk are mitral stenosis, but here now with AFib. AFib, the problem is that it, it can cause you to throw a clot, and so that can become problematic. A lot of these women during the pregnancy, if they choose to go forth with the pregnancy, they have to be put on low molecular weight heparin because they cannot be on warfarin during pregnancy, particularly during the end of the first trimester. And low molecular weight heparin is not quite as good at preventing AFib related incidents as warfarin is. Uncorrected tetralogy of fallow because this is a cyanotic heart disease. Marfans with normal aortic root diameter, which is better than if it's enlarged, and then an artificial valve, much for the same reasons as for AFib because of the possibility of clots and the necessity of being on anticoagulation. High risk pulmonary hypertension, closely related to Eisenmenger syndrome, which is a complication of pulmonary hypertension, peripartum cardiomyopathy, particularly if it is not resolved. About 25 to 50 percent of cases roughly will resolve and they will regain their left ventricular ejection fraction and their function. Uh, but some cases do not resolve, particularly in those cases where they do not reattain their, their left ventricular ejection fraction. Those patients are at seriously increased risk of, of mortality. My sister has a friend who, during her first pregnancy, it was fine. Then about three weeks after she delivered her baby girl, she came down with peripartum cardiomyopathy. I'm not sure the degree to which she recovered, but it was. do you think it was a good idea for her to get pregnant again? No. Did she get pregnant again? Yes, not once, but twice. And now she's on her third pregnancy. Bad, bad idea. 
but what can you do, kids these days? And then Marfan's with dilated aortic root. What are we worried about with the dilated aortic root? We're worried about aortic root dissection, aneurysm, and so forth. And remember that because we have that increased uh, plasma volume, that's going to raise your risk of developing uh, a dissection or an aneurysm because there's just more blood out in, in the circulation. Signs of heart disease in pregnancy. Any diastolic or continuous murmur. Any systolic murmur with a thrill, particularly pan-systolic murmurs with a thrill. And so these are loud murmurs. Symptoms such as clubbing, cyanosis, jugular venous distension, dyspnea, PND, orthopnea, palpitations, and then unequivocal heart enlargement, which you're probably only going to see on echo, but that is uh, an ominous sign when the heart is, is very enlarged. What that shows you is that there's some kind of chronic uh, left ventricular issue, or if it's on both sides, that is uh, sort of a harbinger of peripartum, cardiom or, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. Acquired heart disease in pregnancy. We don't see this like we used to 50 years ago. Congenital heart disease is, is slightly more common nowadays. And the reason is because rheumatic disease used to be the, the driver of what caused complications of acquired heart disease in pregnancy. And we give antibiotics now. When you get a strep infection, you get antibiotics, not because we want to shorten the duration of your sore throat, but because we want to prevent rheumatic disease. And so since we're not seeing rheumatic disease, we're not seeing the mitral stenosis that comes as a consequence of it. And so in particular in the U.S., in the industrialized world where we have good health care, we don't see rheumatic disease, and so we don't see this, the acquired heart disease to the same degree as we used to. Now, if you have patients coming to you from the developing world, your immigrant patients, then you might see this, okay? So, very important that you understand and that you're aware of the fact that pregnancy worsens mitral stenosis. It just so happens that the two things that worsen mitral stenosis, an increase in heart rate and an increased cardiac output, an increased plasma volume, just so happen to be normal changes in pregnancy. In pregnancy, we normally see an increase in heart rate. In pregnancy, we normally see an increased cardiac output. And both of those things worsen mitral stenosis. It doesn't worsen the valve itself, but it worsens the symptoms of mitral stenosis. Why is that? Well, because mitral stenosis causes impaired filling of the left ventricle. You can't get blood as easily from the left atrium to the left ventricle because you have a stenotic valve. You have a blockage, essentially. And when the heart rate goes up, how much time do you spend in systole and diastole relative to when the heart rate is, is baseline? Well, the amount of time you spend in systole always stays the same. It's the amount of time you spend in diastole which shortens when the heart rate goes up. And so diastole is filling of the ventricles. And you already have a problem filling the ventricles when you have mitral stenosis, problem filling the left ventricle. And so now you add on top of, uh, on top of the mitral stenosis where you can't fill your left ventricle, now you're spending even less time in diastole, which is your time that you're supposed to fill your left ventricle. Now you have more blood backed up in the left atrium, which is going to increase the pressure in the pulmonary circulation. And then add on top of that, you already have increased plasma volume during pregnancy. And so all of that blood, it's just more. You have more blood. You have more blood in the left atrium. And so this is going to cause that dyspnea and orthopnea and PND that you see in congestive heart failure. It's all going to get worse with pregnancy. And so perhaps the patient didn't know they had mitral stenosis because it just wasn't that bad. But now they got pregnant and their heart rate went up and their cardiac output is higher, uh, their plasma volume is higher, and now they develop symptoms. Or maybe they did have symptoms before and now those symptoms are getting even worse. Okay, so this is why those symptoms like orthopnea and dyspnea, you need to get an EKG and an echo. The EKG is mostly to look for atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation would occur because you have dilation of the atrium. 
if you have dilation of the atrium, the, if you have atrial fibrillation on EKG, you need to give the patient low molecular weight heparin. We do not give Coumadin, we don't give Warfarin during pregnancy. In particular, we don't want to give it towards the end of the first trimester, but we try to avoid it in general during pregnancy. So you need to get that EKG to look for AFib because it is going to affect our management. If they don't have AFib, you don't need to worry about giving low molecular weight heparin. You also need to get an echo to visualize the degree of mitral stenosis that's present. Other things that are good for patients with mitral stenosis during pregnancy, bed rest. Why bed rest? It's not the same reasons as why they think bed rest might be good during things like preeclampsia, for instance. Bed rest is good in mitral stenosis, unequivocally good in mitral stenosis because it keeps the heart rate down. You do not want to raise the heart rate any further than it needs to be because all that does is shorten your time in diastole even more, and that's going to increase the pressure in the lungs. So you want to keep the heart rate low. You also want to avoid anemia, because anemia is going to cause a consequential increase in the heart rate. So bed rest and avoid anemia. Aortic regurgitation and tricuspid stenosis, while they both also cause diastolic murmur, they tend to be pretty well tolerated in pregnancy. These things, on the other hand, the changes that happen during pregnancy may actually improve these things. So uh, we're not as worried about those things. But this is why if you have a patient that has a diastolic murmur, you need to get an echo because you want to know what is this from. Is this from mitral stenosis or is this from aortic regurgitation? You can't really tell just by oscillating, so you want to find out. Systolic murmur. If the patient has a harsh systolic murmur, you want to know, is this aortic stenosis or mitral regurgitation? You can just get an echo. Don't rely on your oscillation. So get an echo. If it's aortic stenosis, most commonly it's due to a bicuspid aortic valve. You'll be able to tell that on echo. With a bicuspid aortic valve, we have an associated increased risk of aortic dissection because of an increased plasma volume. You have more blood flowing through that aorta. You have a higher likelihood of an aortic dissection. And so we want to know about that as well. Mitral regurgitation, pretty well tolerated in pregnancy. So the stenotic lesions are what we're worried about, mitral stenosis and aortic stenosis. Infective endocarditis is pretty rare in pregnancy, but when it does happen, it's potentially deadly. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Vaginal and cesarean delivery are not indications for routine antibiotic prophylaxis, but often it's given any way to reduce surgical infection, particularly in cesarean delivery. Usually you give a single IV dose of cefazolin or ampicillin, uh, but not to reduce the risk of endocarditis, mostly to reduce the risk of general surgical infections. Cardiomyopathy. So with cardiomyopathy, there is an increased risk of heart failure, arrhythmia, and stroke. Not going to go into this in too great of detail, but hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is one of the most common causes of cardiomyopathy, is typically pretty well tolerated due to the fact that Having a higher plasma volume is good when you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and during pregnancy, it's a good coincidence for those patients that you do have a normally increased plasma volume. Okay, so hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even though it's bad, it's not as bad during pregnancy. Coronary artery disease, pretty rare. Why? Because coronary artery disease is something that we see in 60-year-olds, and 60-year-olds don't get pregnant. So pretty rare during pregnancy. But as the average age of, of pregnant women is going up because a lot of people are delaying pregnancy nowadays, you may see this more and more. And also because people are getting coronary artery disease at younger ages because of diabetes. So uh, it is rare, but uh, in the event you do run into it, you can have a problem because a lot of the drugs that are used in coronary artery disease patients have to be discontinued, things like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and diuretics. You may attempt vaginal delivery in virtually all patients with cardiac disease, but you want to monitor them closely, especially postpartum. Why do you need to monitor them closely postpartum? Because of all of those hemodynamic changes that occur once the placenta is gone. They're going to go back to their pre-pregnancy state, and that can be very shocking to their bodies, and so you want to monitor them closely.
So we have this modified World Health Organization classification for congenital heart disease in pregnancy. So now we're kind of shifting tracks on congenital heart diseases. And this just classifies the congenital heart diseases as far as their risk during pregnancy. So on the, uh, we have class 1, which is no detectable increase. These are things like uncomplicated patent ductus arteriosus, mitral valve prolapse, simple lesions that have been repaired, and ectopic beats. Very, very, very low to absent increased risk of, uh, of problems. Class 2 is a small increase, and this, this uh, risk here that we're talking about here is, is just general morbidity and mortality. So these are things like atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, repaired tetralogy, mild left ventricular impairment, Marfans with an aortic root of less than 40 millimeters diameter, that is normal. And bicuspid valve, that's a bicuspid aortic valve, uh, with ascending aorta of less than 45 millimeters diameter. So these are just Marfans and bicuspid aortic valve that don't have any uh, associated abnormalities of the aorta. So these are very, very small increase in maternal morbidity and mortality. And so not very problematic. Then we run into class 3, which is a significant increase. So this would be things like mechanical valve, which always requires anticoagulation. Unrepaired cyanotic disease. Not very common anymore because we repair these things. Marfan's disease, but now we have a slightly enlarged aortic root. Bicuspid aortic valve, but now we have a slightly enlarged ascending aorta. And then Fontan circulation, not going to go into that in too great of detail, but the Fontan procedure is a procedure that's used to correct a congenital heart defect. Uh, you kind of rewire the circulation a little bit, but that itself increases your risk of problems during pregnancy, morbidity, and mortality. And then we have the class 4 issues here, which confer an extremely increased risk of maternal morbidity and mortality. And all of these things are contraindications to getting pregnant in the first place. And so these patients need to be aware that they really should not be getting pregnant. And this includes anybody with an NYHA class of three or four. Pulmonary hypertension, uh, which includes Eisenmenger syndrome. Left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 30. What's our normal left ventricular ejection fraction? You should know this for the test. 55 to 70 percent. So that's severely reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Much more reduced than just mild left ventricular impairment, which would be class 2. So that would be something like, you know, let's say their left ventricular ejection fraction was 50 or 48. That would be class 2. But if it's 29, that's going to be class 4. And typically these patients are already NYHA 3 or 4. Severe coarctation of the aorta, not so common anymore because we repair these. Marfans with aortic root of 45 millimeters or more. Bicuspid aortic valve with an ascending aorta diameter of 50 millimeters or more. Severe mitral aortic stenosis or unresolved peripartum cardiomyopathy. In other words, peripartum cardiomyopathy where the left ventricular ejection fraction has not recovered. There's residual uh, there's residual impairment after six months. In all these cases, pregnancy would be contraindicated. So if you have a patient that comes to you and she's pregnant, or she wants to get pregnant, and she has Marfan syndrome, what's going to be something that you want to do unequivocally? You want to get an echocardiogram because you want to see what class does she fall into. If her aortic root is 38 millimeters, and she's class 2. She's good to go as far as getting pregnant. Very small increase in morbidity and mortality. However, if it's 50 millimeters, well, she really shouldn't get pregnant. So Marfan's patients can get pregnant. They may get pregnant. But whether or not that's advisable really depends on that aortic root. And so that's why you want to get an echo. So risk factors for all patients with congenital heart disease, the number one risk factor that we're most worried about is the presence of pulmonary hypertension. And there's various ways that you can measure this, uh, but an echo, particularly one with Doppler, can really help you. And this will help you determine if there's any kind of flow issues. And usually patients with Eisenmenger syndrome will already be symptomatic, but patients who have Eisenmenger syndrome absolutely 
unequivocally should never get pregnant. This is the most serious risk factor for maternal morbidity and mortality. Patients with Eisenmenger syndrome have a greater than 50% mortality. So if a patient with Eisenmenger syndrome gets pregnant, more likely than not, they're going to die. And the majority of deaths that occur in association with pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger syndrome during pregnancy actually don't occur during the pregnancy. They occur during delivery uh, or in the first week postpartum, which tells you that those changes to the maternal circulation, the maternal hemodynamics, it's really the changes that occur after the pregnancy that are more problematic than the changes that occur during the pregnancy. If they have cyanosis, that is a problem. If they are already poor functional class, NYHA 3 or 4, as you remember, that's a class 4 a contraindication for pregnancy. Aortic disease, so if they have Marfan syndrome, bicuspid aortic valve, both of those increase the risk of aortic dissection. And then if they have an elevated BNP at 20 weeks gestation, don't worry about that. But BNP is more and more commonly being drawn as a prognosticator during pregnancy. So you may see some maternal fetal medicine specialist ordering this. You don't need to worry about it. We have something called the Zahara score, and then there's another thing called the Carpreg score. These are uh, scoring devices that you can use to prognosticate the risk during pregnancy or even before the pregnancy. So this is an example here of the Zahara score and you're just taking these different things. All of these things are poor prognosticators for pregnancy, and then you put together this uh, point total, and it tells you your risk of quote-unquote cardiac events, and this can include things like decompensated heart failure, aortic dissection, thromboembolism, basically a risk of really bad things happening during pregnancy. You can see that if you have none of these, your risk is only 2.9%, which is probably similar to what it is in the general population, maybe a little bit worse. If you're in the middle, then your risk is about 17.5%. If you're really high, 70%. Do you think these patients should be getting pregnant? No. So these are things you want to look at when a patient with known cardiac history comes to you saying that she wants to get pregnant, or if she's very early on in her pregnancy. And I don't like to get into the ethics, but some of these patients, you may advise them that they may want to consider terminating the pregnancy. Certainly not something that I would personally advise ethically because I am of a certain ethical bend when it comes to pregnancy termination, but I fully understand that when the mother's life is possibly in jeopardy, that may be a decision she wants to make and she should make. It's a personal decision. Okay, so general care. All women who want to get pregnant who have a known cardiac history should have a preconception evaluation by a cardiologist. In other words, this should be done as early as possible. Now, some women may come to you pregnant and they have a known cardiac history. In that case, they need to be, get, they, they need to be seen by a cardiologist as soon as possible. Uh, but ideally, women who have a cardiac history will see a cardiologist before they get pregnant. An assessment will include an EKG to look for atrial fibrillation in particular. Uh, but really any arrhythmia, echocardiogram, and assessment of functional class, that NYHA thing. You want to perform all indicated cardiac intervention prior to conception. So that may include things like valvular replacement, balloon valvuloplasty. You want to do all those things prior to conception. Now, if those things are indicated, particularly a balloon valvuloplasty, if they're indicated during the pregnancy, you may do it, but you want to avoid it. You ideally like to do it before conception, so you want to get that stuff out of the way. Patient education, make sure that she's aware of the risks of pregnancy because she is at increased risk uh, in general. Some things more than others, though. Obviously, if she's got pulmonary hypertension, it's a much greater risk than if she doesn't. And then close follow-up with a cardiologist during pregnancy. And the frequency of the follow-ups will depend on her functional class. So if she's NYHA 3 or 4 and she's pregnant, she needs to see the cardiologist a lot more than if she's NYHA 1 and only has a uh, repaired tetralogy or a PDA or a ventricular septal defect and stuff like that. So just to recap, heart disease confers increased morbidity and mortality in pregnant women 
and it increases the risk of adverse outcomes like spontaneous abortion, preterm delivery, fetal immaturity and death, and perinatal morbidity and mortality. We didn't really go into it, but why might this cause an increased risk of fetal immaturity and death? Well, if she has some kind of cyanotic issue, like let's say that she's got a right-to-left shunt, she's going to have less oxygenated blood going out into the peripheral circulation, less oxygenated blood going to the placenta, baby's going to get less oxygen, baby's not going to grow as well. EKG and echocardiography can assess the extent of heart disease, so they are always indicated in women who have a cardiac history who get pregnant. If she has mitral stenosis, two of the things you want her to do, uh, refrain from strenuous activity, ideally bed rest, and avoid anemia. So iron supplementation. Presence of AFib or mechanical heart valve necessitates anticoagulation. In that case, you want to use low molecular weight heparin, like Lovenox. You don't want to use warfarin, but in particular, you don't want to use warfarin during 6 to 12 weeks gestation. You can run into teratogenicity. Now, this is when you really don't want to use it, but most OBs will not give warfarin at all during pregnancy. Preconceptional and prenatal management should include consultation and follow-up with a cardiologist, especially a cardiologist, ideally, who has experience dealing with pregnant women. And then also you want consultation with a high-risk pregnancy or maternal fetal medicine specialist. They will probably be the ones that will uh, be managing the pregnancy. Any corrective surgery should be performed prior to conception, if at all possible. Vaginal delivery is acceptable, absent obstetric indications. As a matter of fact, we prefer to deliver these women vaginally because of the uh, anesthesia issues with, with C-sections, uh, what that can lead to hemodynamically can cause some instability. And so ideally, we like to deliver these women vaginally. And then, of course, you want to monitor these patients very closely postpartum, depending on how severe their cardiac disease was, Many of these patients will need to be monitored in an ICU. And that is all I've got for you. If you have any questions, please write me a note below.